Greetings, programs. This is Wretch, and welcome back to Deadlands Noir, that old-time religion. In the first episode, we were introduced to private investigator Harvey Jenkins and him getting drawn into a plot involving the religious leaders of 1935 New Orleans. The leading Baptist minister has been kidnapped, and Harvey's been hired to find him, and we've already have some suspects and have been attacked by cultists on the way, so good times. We have three options here. We can talk to Mama Bonte, ask around on the streets, or perhaps the divine, divine or Gospel Divine will know more about these freaks. Um, from how I understand, Mama Bonte and I have some history, or at least Harvey and Mama Bonte have some history. So let's go ahead and talk to her and see what we can do. You got yourself in a mess again, child. Coco skin and a smoke and silk voice with that Creole spice made my spine tingle every time. Mama Bonte and I had something. There was no point in defining it or making it more than it was. We simply understood each other as a part of the city most folks didn't even want to think about, and we helped each other as best we could. There are worse ways to conduct a relationship. I think I can blame you a bit for this one, sweetness. I gave her a challenging look. She just laughed. Fair enough, Mr. Jenkins. Fair enough. You be tough to kill, gonna probably be useful this time around, too. There be bad mojo at work, no mistake. That gospel divine don't be bringing the Lord to New Orleans. He be bringing the devil. And it gonna get real ugly real soon you don't figure out how to deal with him. I don't suppose you got any ideas about that, do you? I really hated dealing with magic and monsters, and yet it seemed I was somehow linked to them every time I turned around. I was pretty sure I had my grandfather to blame for that. Me and Daddy Thunderhead been looking into it. You get me something I can work with, child, I might be able to help you. Man like Gospel, he got to be messing with powers he don't quite understand, and that usually means talismans and such. Get me something like that, and I think I can work you up a way to handle things. Maybe. I didn't like the word maybe, especially not when my continued breathing hung on it. Time to get some more clues. Oh, we can go ahead and show, okay, we can go talk to uh, Devino, the traveling evangelist. He's probably the core of this entire thing. We can also show Mama Bonte the medallions we found earlier. So let's go ahead and do that. Well now, Mr. Jenkins, these be real interesting. Talismans they are. Somebody be using them to make men into something else. Something strong, tough, and very loyal to ever be working the mojo. Mama Bonte was studying the trinkets I'd brought her very carefully. And it was clear she was more than a little concerned about what she was seeing. In fact, she looked downright angry. This be like some very black magic I'd done seen more than once, Harvey. Very bad. Make a person into a thing. Take away their light forever. Even after you take this off them, they ain't never going to be the same again. A ghost of what they was, with no hope and no path. Most of them will just find a way to end their life, because they can't see no light without the one who made them like this in the first place. I grimaced at that. I left those guys to wake up and just go look for a way to die. Still, not a whole lot I could do about that now. So how do I deal with this, Mama? How do you fight this kind of monster? She looked at me, and a moment of real concern passed through those deep, black eyes. Harvey, you try not to deal with them. You can help it. I started to protest, and she held up a hand. But I know you are me, and you're gonna finish what you start. Keep one of these. It may help. You get into anything with some of them again. Meantime, I look into what I can do to give you some stronger. Gonna need time, though, so try not to get killed before I get done. That was fine advice by me. I was rather fond of not getting killed at all, frankly. I died once. It wasn't a habit I wanted to get into. Well, that's interesting. Um, well, we can get a read on the streets and the gospel divine. Hmm. Well, let's go ahead and get a read on the streets. There are plenty of fine, safe places in New Orleans. The kinds of places folks go to have a nice dinner, hear some great music, and enjoy the beauty of the city. Those aren't the kind of places I go on days like this. Seedy dive bars, old dock sides with rotted wood and rotted fish, back alleyways that get the wrong people robbed or dead. These are the places I wander when I need to get a feel for what's happening in the city. 
These are the places I haunt like a gray-suited ghost. Fortunately, Rabbi Koch's check was good, and I had plenty of green to spread where I needed to. I soon figured out a few interesting things. For one, the streets were a lot less crowded with bums in the down and out. Seems like Gospel Divine's Revival was offering food, work, and more to anyone who wanted to come out, hear the word, and pitch in. Desperate folks can find an awful lot of religion in their bones when there's a hot bowl of soup and a couple of dollars in it for them. What disturbed me more, by far, were the tales of very large men in black suits, black shirts with no ties, and strange brands on their foreheads, and we've met, one of, we've met them already. Apparently they never spoke, instead just standing around and watching other folks intently. From what I could put together, they seemed mostly focused on folks who had gone to see Gospel Divine but didn't sign on to his cause or donate any money. When the local constables got around to asking some of these gorillas about their business, apparently, the only thing they said was, We are here to bear witness. Sounds familiar? This was sounding more and more like a confidence game with a shakedown element. And I was hoping that all of it, that's all it was, but a man doesn't easily take a brand on his forehead just to scare money out of folks. I was beginning to think these witnesses were going to be real trouble. Where next? Well, we've eliminated all the options. Let's drive on out to the tent revival site. I made my way out past the city limits, where some farmer had given up a huge part of his fields for the circus that Gospel Devino had brought in. A huge, colorful sign hung over the whole mess, reading, The Gospel, Divine Revelations, and Redemption Revival. All sinners welcome. It was nice to feel like I was invited. Dozens, maybe even hundreds of folks were busy with any number of tasks, or milling about and talking with each other like they were at a church social, which I suppose was pretty much the case. There was one huge big top style tent in the middle of the gathering, with smaller tents, trailers, and temporary buildings sprung up like mushrooms in a cow pasture. That was apropos, since we were actually in a cow pasture to start with. Two things caught my attention right away. The first was how big the tent was clearly being guarded, or how the big tent was clearly being guarded at all entrances, and it looked like only a few, very few select few were allowed in or out. Folks dressed far better than the average hanger-on seemed like they had some kind of authority or special role in things. Anyone else who got too curious about what was beyond the flaps was rather forcefully pushed back by the guards. That was the other thing that got my attention: the guards. All of them were huge men, dressed in black suits with black shirts, no ties. And they all had an X branded right on their foreheads. As the horror of that particularly creepy bit of business settled in, the dapper gentleman picked his way through the mud and manure towards me, carefully stepping on the straw that had been hastily strewn about to cover most of the mire. Greetings, Pilgrim. I'm Brother James. Have you come to wash away your sins and become a part of our movement? I tried to smile, though the look of the guards weighed heavily on me. His slightly swarmy nature didn't actually do a lot for my disposition either. Brother James, while I appreciate your concern for my soul, I doubt you've got enough water or wine out here to wash away all of my sins. Actually, I'm here to see if I can talk to Mr. Gospel Devino. Brother James' expression didn't change one iota, his smile still perfectly planted on his face. Nonetheless, I got the distinct impression that he'd already decided he didn't like me. That was fine. Most people don't like me when they first meet me. People tend to like me even less after they get to know me. Many wish to seek the blessed wisdom of Brother Gospel Divine, sir. He tries to reach out to all, but I am sure you can understand he is a very busy, very involved man. He will preach tonight, as always. If you join us for the nightly service, I am certain his words of inspiration and guidance will reach you. Brother... It was clear Brother James was finishing or fishing for my name. Though I had no inclination to add him to my family tree as a brother, I obliged him. After all, it's a polite thing to do when you're snooping into a man's business. Jenkins. Harvey Jenkins. I produced my credentials. Private investigator. This time, Brother James' expression did change. The smile slightly faded. He was clearly moving into a defensive frame of mind. They all do when they see the badge. I, I am quite certain, Mr. Jenkins, I have no idea what this is about, but I can assure you we all have the necessary permits and licenses. While a number of folks have claimed some concern for family members who have joined us, no one is here unless they wish to be. There are a few esteemed members of law enforcement and local government even who are among our ranks. There are no irregularities for you to investigate. 
He said that last word with a certain amount of disdain, like most people say the word fornicate. I put on my pleasant, patient face. It doesn't look too different from my usual face, except that it makes me look a little less like I'm about to punch or shoot you. James, I am sure that is all fine. I just like to ask the good brother divine a couple of questions. Regarden, this didn't come from Persigny brother James, but from a golden, powerful voice behind him. We both turned to see a man in a pure white suit with a white shirt and a white tie. He had on a white fedora and carried a silver cane with a golden cross on top. He was flanked by two of those huge branded men with a lovely scarlet haired lady carrying a notebook next to him. Her black skirt was hip hugging and just barely decent in length. Barely. He strode up confidently and every single pair of eyes in the area was on him. Looks of adoration came from most save a few who spared me looks of far less than that. He seemed incapable of getting any mud or muck on his pristine suit. I'd have paid good money for that ability. Brother James, Brother James leaped into explanation. Brother Divine, you've no need to console yourself with this matter, I assure you. This is just another one of those P.I.s some non-believer has hired to try and convince a loved one to abandon our cause. Gospel Divine wasn't a large man. In fact, he was a bit on the short side and skinny to boot, yet his presence was formidable. So handsome, he was practically pretty, and oozing charisma out of every pore. If I hadn't already faced down things from the pit of hell a few times, I might have been actually impressed. He appraised me carefully as he spoke. Is that true, sir? You're here to try and convince a member of my flock to leave us? I looked him straight in the eyes. I got the impression he wasn't used to that. I couldn't tell if he liked or hated it. No, sir, nothing like that. I'm just here to ask you a few questions about the disappearance of Reverend Paul Kellerman there. So often comes down to just saying the right thing at the right time. If you know what to watch for, and any PI who wants to make a living at this figures this out, it comes down to the reaction to your words in that one moment. Divine was good. I had to give him that. Nothing. Not a twitch. Not a tell of any kind. I might as well have said, I just came for a cheeseburger and some fries. Took a wrong turn for all the reaction I got in the moment. No, it was Brother James and the Redhead who gave it away. She focused just a little too intently on her notebook, and James's eyes narrowed just for an instant before he caught himself. Just like a really intense game of poker between two sharks, Gospel Divine and I both knew what had happened. I had him, and he knew it. He was a pro, though, and the game still had to play out. Yes, I'd heard about that poor man being kidnapped the other night. He and I might not see eye to eye on matters of the spirit, Mr. Jenkins, but I still consider any harm brought to a brother in Christ to be a terrible tragedy. If you are looking into his disappearance, I am grateful. I am, however, unclear on how I might be of help here. Time to play my trump. Well, sir, considering you and his daughter have some kind of relationship, I was rather hoping you might have had some dealing with the Kellermans lately and could help me get a sense who might have had it in for him. A slight smile played at one corner of his mouth. He was actually enjoying this. Ah, uh, Miss Rachel Kellerman. Yes, she and I have had a correspondence. Though I consider it to be of a private nature, I will reveal to you that she and I have a certain level of agreement where her father's overly tolerant nature is concerned. I've been hoping to meet her in person while here, but we've not managed that just yet. I'm sorry, but if that's all, I'm afraid I have a service to prepare for. Realizing that I'd gotten what I'd come for, I decided it might be time for a tactical withdrawal. After all, I really didn't like how those giants with the branded foreheads were looking at me. Honestly, Mr. Devineau, please, Mr. Jenkins, call me Divine. Fat chance. Sir, I just felt like such a large congregation of spiritual folks might have had some helpful information. I can see you're very, very busy, so I'll let you get back to your work. I handed the redhead my card. I was pretty sure no one had ever handed Gospel Divine anything directly. If you do come across any information, I'll be grateful to hear from you. I turned to go at that, figuring this part of the game was over. Not quite. Mr. Jenkins! His voice rang like a bell, and I couldn't help but stop in my tracks and turn to face him again. He strode very purposely towards me, and I was shocked to see that even his bodyguards held back. Brother James was already on his way to instruct others in one task or another, and though it was clear that their leader had one more thing to say to me, most folks seemed inclined to stay out of business that didn't concern them. The glares of the bodyguard seemed to help in that. Devineau caught up to me, and he stood close enough to speak at a near whisper. 
You've been touched, Mr. Jenkins. Touched by shadows, by darkness. We both know it. He looked at me intently, obviously expecting some kind of response. I didn't oblige him. He went on. My ministry could use one of your gifts and your experience, sir. I promise you, the rewards would be most... He glanced back at the redhead, who was looking nervously our way. Fulfilling. I can also promise you that anything that interferes with the ministry runs the very real risk of facing terrible wrath. God's will must be done, Mr. Jenkins. It must be done. I just stared at him for a long moment. I could have gone the usual, is that a threat route, but again, we both knew the game well enough to avoid the cliché. Of course, it was a threat. He'd made his play to recruit me, now it was my turn. I know a handful of folks who feel pretty particular about God's will, Mr. Devineau, and I'm pretty sure they don't agree with you on just what that means. Then I smiled, turned, and walked away from him, saying over my shoulder, and I'm pretty sure you don't buy the crap you're selling either. Now, where should we investigate first? I think it's time to pay another visit to Rachel Kellerman. Fair enough. Oh, crap. It didn't look like I was going to get my second interview with Rachel, K Rachel Kellerman. The front door was busted wide open, half off the hinges. The two uniforms were lying dead on the stoop. One's neck was broken, the other's face was smashed in. I could still smell the gunpowder. They had gotten shots off. Apparently, it hadn't mattered much. I pulled my 38 anyway and went inside Rachel's place. Looking down the hall, I could see the wide open back door where the other two cops were also mangled up. The whole place was a trashed mess, and the power was out. I lit a candle and started looking around some more, hoping against hope I might find someone still breathing here. I found him in the busted form of Hal Blake. His back had been broken like a twig. His eyes were bulging from the excruciating pain, and blood was pouring out of him from places it shouldn't. His gun, clearly empty, lay nearby, and it looked like he was fiddling with that same cigar with his one good hand. The other was obviously paralyzed, along with most of his body. He eyed me warily at first, but when he realized who it was, he gave a slight, wheezy chuckle that erupted into a spasm of painful coughing. I knelt down next to him and looked at him, eye to eye. We both knew he wasn't going to make it. <laughs> hey, Harvey. Back to see if you could score with that sweet frail. Jesus, Hal. What the hell happened? As I asked, I took the cigar, lit it for him, and stuck it in his mouth. I hated the guy, but this was an awful way to go, and he deserved the last smoke, at least. He inhaled deeply, coughed some more blood up. I was afraid I was going to lose him before he could tell me what happened. Then he looked at me with something that approached regret. Never been any good, Jenkins. We both know that. But you gotta know I tried. I tried to fight those lummoxes off. I nodded, wanting him to continue. Divine hired me specific to watch after her. Said he had a particular Karen for and wanted to make sure he had eyes on her all the time. All I had to do was report back to him about anything that happened or anyone she talked to. He looked away for a moment. I knew that meant me, too. Paycheck's a paycheck, Hal. No hard feelings. I actually meant it, too. He was in enough pain. So tell me how this happened to you. He actually looked back at me with gratitude in his eyes and took another drag of the cigar. After some more coughing, he went on. I could tell I was losing him, though, and he got that ashen, pale look in his face. These giant mooks came busting in the place, screaming something about bearing witness or something. And they tore through the flat rooms like they was nothing, and I emptied my piece into the first one in the room. He staggered and fell back, but he didn't fall. He didn't fall, Harvey! He clutched at my jacket, desperation. Or excuse me, he, he clutched back at my jacket, desperation in his eyes. What kind of monster don't fall when you shoot it like that? I couldn't answer him. There were too many in the world like that, to be sure. He started to fade away, eyes closing slowly as he took another deep puff of on his cigar. They grabbed the dame. I tried to fight him and grab her back. One picked me up and broke me across his knee like I was kindling. Then you showed up. He smiled slightly. At least I gotta go out like a hero for a change. That was the end of Hal Blake. I was thinking of writing a letter to his family when I heard the heavy breathing and the heavier footsteps. We have come to bear witness! Oh. Well. Some like it hot. Now let's see if this medallion that, uh. 
Mama Bonte gave us does any good. As the witnesses closed in, I scrambled to grab my pistol out of the shoulder holster. Yeah, a dumb move really, since Hal had just died telling me how little good shooting them would do. My hand brushed up against the medallion Mama Bonte had insisted I, kept, I keep from my last encounter with these guys, or from my last encounter. I wasn't real sure how it was going to be any use, but I was quickly running out of options. I struggled fully up to my feet and put my back against the wall, even as they kept coming. I yanked the medallion out and held it in front of me, displaying it for them to see in the flickering candlelight. Thankfully, it got their attention. They stopped and stared at it, almost like children watching a magic tri trick being performed. I wasn't sure what to do next, though, and my sudden moment of hope expired as they growled in unison and started f forward, forward again. We have come to bear witness! For some strange reason, I thought of my mother. It occurred to me how completely offended she'd be by these guys, looking all religious while they did the kind of savage murder that made you think of the Spanish Inquisition. I couldn't honestly tell you why I did what I did next. Maybe it was the memory of my mother made me think of it. Maybe I was divinely inspired. Maybe I was just too desperate to think of anything else. I started reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our Father. They stopped, winced, and growled again. The medallion seemed to glow warm, or grow warm. Who art in heaven? They staggered back, almost in unison. Whimpers of pain came from each of them, and their hands moved up to cover their ears. Hallowed be thy name. They started to scream, each one dropping to his knees. Blood began to pour from their mouths, turning their screams to gurgling, choking sounds. I kept intoning the prayer, hoping maniacally that I wouldn't forget part of it. I didn't. In another few moments, it was beyond certain that they were dead. As I spoke the final Amen, the medallion suddenly went up in a fiery flash. I dropped it, but it was ashes floating to the floor by the time I fully let go. Stunned, I stepped over their bodies and made my way outside again. There was Mama Bonte, standing on the front lawn grinning, a shotgun in her arms. I told you to use the medallion to fight him, she looked me up and down. I got another one for you, and this one be special. Daddy Thunderhand and I make it a solid charm. He and the others be working a circle to try and protect the city, because it seemed divine, Gospel Divine gonna bring very black magic tonight. You best be going, child, or this whole city gonna be a mess. With a deep kiss, she gave me the medallion, which apparently had some kind of oils on it. They'd also marked it up with a bunch of other symbols. I slipped it over my head, and then she handed me the shotgun and a box of shells. You want a real gun time like this, honey? I pulled up at the gate of the place and immediately knew something was wrong. It might have had something to do with the way the two witnesses were standing right in the way, staring holes through me. It could have had something to do with the way a sudden storm seemed to be rolling in right over our heads. It might even have been the strange discords between what sounded like very strange Bible hymns and a screaming woman. I was fairly certain, however, that it had a lot to do with the way the amulet around my neck was practically buzzing from vibration and glowing straight through my shirt. Even as the Bruthers held their hands up to stop me, I hit the gas, hard, and ran right through them. As strong and tough as they were, they weren't up to a couple of tons of Detroit steel being pushed by a motor that had once belonged in a police cruiser. Of course, my car wasn't much up for running through human brick walls either. Fixing that grill was going to be on my expense report. I leapt out, shotgun in hand. One of the monsters was already getting backed up, or back up. The medallion seemed to flash a little as I ratcheted around and fired. The witness screamed in agony and fell dead as I blew a hole in him. The hole was bigger than I expected, even for a shotgun. <laughs> Thank you, Daddy Thunderhand. Silently thanking Mama Bonte for having the sense to get a real shotgun and not a breech load double barrel, I ratcheted another round and made for the big tent. The show was in there, whatever it was. As I got closer, I could hear Brother Gospel Divine's voice ringing out over the chants and the songs and even the screaming. Friends! Brothers and sisters in Christ, the time has come at last. As I promised you, revelations at hand. Judgment day is upon us and we are the faithful army that the Lord has called to fight for this earth. Here at the heart of sin itself, we will rise up and wash away the stains of greed, sodomy, and unrighteousness with the blood of those who have turned away from God. Can I get a hallelujah? The crowd screamed in unison, hallelujah. Two more witnesses came at me from the side. In rapid succession, I put them down. That left me two shots, which I used on two more running around from the other side. I quickly reloaded as I made my way to the side of the tent. I could tell some folks had heard the shots. Mumbles and mutterings started to emanate from the crowd within. 
Brother Divine didn't want to lose his audience, though. See? Already the minions of Satan come to disrupt our work. Fear not, brothers and sisters, for my witnesses will stand as a wall between them and what we do here. Not so much, Gospel, I muttered as I squatted down, yanked on the spikes holding the tent down where I was, and then rolled up under and into the tent. What I saw before me stopped me in my tracks. There in the center of the tent, up on a raised platform, Gospel Devineau strolled about and addressed the crowd in the bleachers. He was still in his dazzling white suit, gesturing with his cane, only it was no longer a cane. Turns out it was one of those fancy schmancy cane swords, and he'd drawn the blade out. There were two metal arches with straps, one on each end of the platform. Trussed up on one was the Reverend Paul Kellerman. On the other, and the source of all the screaming, was his daughter, Rachel. Gospel, why are you doing this to me? She pleaded, tears running down her face. I believed in you, supported you. For God's sake, I delivered my own father to you. He smiled beatifically, or whatever that, how do you pronounce that? In fact, you did, lovely Rachel. In fact, you did. As any succubus from hell might in a misguided attempt to curry favor with an angel of the Lord. It is for naught, though. The Lord God has always demanded great sacrifices to work his wrath upon the world, and today I stand before my brothers and sisters, his appointed angel, ready to unleash his mighty anger upon this sinful city. Even as he spoke the words and the crowd erupted with great cheers, I find myself dizzied by not one, but two afterimages that were playing over him. One was a glowing white angelic form with huge broad wings. If that was what the folks were seeing, no wonder he had them all eating out of the palm of his hand. The other, which was actually a little more pronounced for me as I touched the amulet, was an inky black figure with cold, wide eyes. It seemed to almost cavort about as he continued pacing the stage, anticipating the carnage to come. It seemed particularly interested in Rachel. Every time I got near the Reverend, who was calmly praying with his eyes closed and had been since I came into the tent, the figure seemed to almost recoil. When it got close to Rachel again, it seemed to grow slightly. That's when I realized what I was seeing. It seemed like it was somehow feeding off of her. With every shriek of horror, it seemed to laugh and grow stronger. This thing was feeding off of her fear. That's when I noticed the swirling shadows up at the top of the tent. Dozens, no, hundreds, of inky black creatures swarming up there, hovering as though they were waiting for something. And they all looked... hungry. My eyes went down to the crowd in the bleachers, all caught up in the gospel's mesmerizing spell, and it finally hit me. He was going to put one of those things in each and every person here. They were all going to become part of his own personal army of demon hosts. Even as I figured this out, a shout came from the stands near me. Some of the crowd had noticed me, as had some of the witnesses near the closest exit. So had the dark figure, and Gospel Divine. I was going to have to do something fast before the whole place came down on me. Oh... Okay, well, we've got an interesting decision, guys. I don't know how much of the book is left, but I think we will leave it for next time. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. If you liked the video, go ahead and click like down below, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, that'd be a big help, and we'll see you next time. Later days, everyone.